Dr. Fang Overkleid is the Foundation Director of the Center for Community Child Health at the Royal Children's Hospital. Professor Overkleid is an internationally recognized researcher, author, lecturer, and a consultant. He has written two books and hundreds of scientific publications. He is also recipient of numerous awards. Actually, I was doing some research on your work and then, uh, your CV actually, and then I found out that you have written two books on childcare and several scientific publications on childcare. So, if you could tell us more about this. Um, the first book I wrote was for parents. It was called Your Child's Health, and it was like a compendium of all the information that parents needed to know about child development, about um, treatment of illness, about when to seek help. This was before the internet. And so parents relied on written information, um, and it was very successful. I wrote it with a co-author, and uh, it uh, made several editions. It was reprinted several times, and now with the internet, everybody goes online to look at information. So after I think three editions, there was no need for it anymore. So that was my first book, and then my second book was uh, it was called Health in Early Childhood Settings. So th that was written primarily for childcare workers and preschool teachers and it covered a whole range of health issues that the uh, educators would find in their uh, early childhood settings. So they were my two books and then I've been a researcher all my life so I've written uh, many articles on research. Probably the biggest volume of research that I've written about was on temperament which is like individual differences of children. Uh, children are born with differences. Children with an easy temperament are very easy to parent children who are born with a difficult te temperament can often be very challenging and as they grow up uh, that influences parenting it influences children's reaction to illness so my whole area of interest both clinical and research is in what we call in Australia developmental and behavioral pediatrics so these are problems of development and of behavior both normal development and normal behavior but also problems so I'm interested in why babies cry and fuss, sleep problems, uh, developmental delay, language difficulties, behavior problems in the preschool period, school readiness, learning difficulties, that whole range of problems which are just so common now. Many of these aren't, uh, don't need to be problems, these are just normal developmental issues that many children have. For example, all two-year-olds cause behavior problems because the normal development of a two-year-old is to challenge behavior, challenge boundaries. Uh, so sometimes my work is just reassuring parents, this is fine, this is what we expect, don't worry, it'll pass. Here are some strategies for what you can do to help. And then there are more serious problems as well, um, a more serious developmental delay, significant behavior problems which challenge both parents and teachers. So they're my clinical interests and that's what I write about as well. Why did you feel the need to write uh, two books? Um, especially the books? Well that's a very good question. I, I, I think um, it, it sounds a little arrogant, I had something I wanted to share, uh, but I think in my centre, my academic centre in Melbourne now, we have a major effort on dissemination and translation of information um, so that uh, we translate the research that we do and that our colleagues all over the world do so that it can influence public policy and service delivery and clinical practice and parenting. So it's often said that children aren't born with a manual. Uh, so parents often have to struggle by themselves. There's a lot of information that pediatricians and other professionals have, which we try and share with, with parents. So parents who are well informed, who feel confident about their parenting, who know what's normal and what's abnormal, who know when to reach help. That's what we always are aiming to achieve. And I think my writing was really an attempt to give parents that information. And if you could summarize everything in my book, it's a thick book, in one phrase, it would be for parents, trust your instincts. That often parents have lost confidence on what they need to do. They ask experts all over the place, they get anxious. And what we've found in Australia, at least, is an increase in parent anxiety about parenting. And part of that is there's no extended family. I don't know what it's like in Bhutan, but here we don't live in multiple generations. And so there's no grandparents to ask. Uh, parents are very, very busy. Uh, 
um, society is much quicker. Uh, so they lose confidence in what to do, what the right thing is to do, and they seek information. And so wrote, writing the book was my attempt to give them accurate information because and even now on the internet we have a lot of effort on getting accurate information out there because one of the dangers of the internet is that parents don't know what's accurate information and what's inaccurate. Uh, so we try and stamp some authoritative um, information there to say, look, don't believe everything you hear. This comes from our hospital or it comes from our university. You can trust this information. Uh, as the uh, doctor was mentioning uh, right now, that uh, uh, most uh, uh, children in Bhutan are looked after by their grandparents, actually. Like, we don't, it's difficult to get babysitter also. Sure. So, um, uh, uh, like, I think most of the parents, they kind of fear that uh, the children, they grow up uh, with uh, like grandparents and then they don't have much friends. So uh, that's why I think people who can afford, they uh, put their children in easy cities, but yes. there are like some who cannot afford. Yeah. So, uh, how, how do you think it uh, influences a child's uh, brain development and growth in the long run? Well, you know, grandparents is both good and bad. I don't mean bad, but it's very good because parents are confident that the child will be in a loving situation. You know, they can trust their grandparents, etc. On the other hand, as you say, um, sometimes the child can be isolated. And we know that one of the very important things for young children is social interaction. You know, um, we call it social emotional development where they learn to socialize with other children, they learn to interact, they learn to share things. Uh, so that's very important as well. So I think it's important to get a balance between those two. We always encourage in our country, in most Western countries, children to go to childcare and preschool for that very reason. Uh, if there are trained staff there, if it's high quality childcare, then the early years professional can create a stimulating environment and that's important for brain development. We can talk about that in a moment, but it also provides the opportunity for socialization, for sharing. And I'm told that at school, school teachers can, can see which children have been to preschool and which haven't because they're more confident in their socialization, uh, they're, they're less isolated. So there's pluses and minuses of grandparents looking after children. It's wonderful for the grandparents, of course, because they get to look after their grandchildren, but I can see for parents it can be a mixed bag. And uh, uh, most of the experts, they say that first five years of childhood is very important yes. for the child. Yes. So how do you explain it? Well, there's been an explosion of research in the last 20, 25 years, which um, points to the importance of those early years, well before a child gets to school. Uh, there's been some very empirical research on the way the brain develops, not just in the f after birth, but even in utero. So this starts from the time of conception. We know how important it is to create a good environment for children, both an in utero environment, that is before the child is born, and then afterwards. So we always tell um, uh, pregnant women they must look after their health. They shouldn't smoke, they shouldn't drink, they should look for, check any health problems that they have. And then once children are born, we know how important that environment is. So the way children develop is always this dance between the genes that we're born with and the environment. It's this ongoing infinite dance. We can't do much to affect the genes, but we can do a lot to affect the environment. And we know now that, we've, we've known for a long time now, but the brain development research brings this into a very sharp focus. We know exactly the sort of conditions that a young child needs in those early years to thrive and prosper. They need good nutrition. They need uh, protection from infection. That's why immunization is so important. They need to be safe. That's why parents have to create a safe environment so children don't injure themselves. But more than anything, they need a warm environment, a, a warm relationship with their parents and with their caregivers. That relationship needs to be stimulating. It needs to be responsive. It needs to be language rich. Um, and that sort of early years environment is very, very important in actually molding the brain. And we talk in terms of the foundations of a house. When we're building a house, the foundations that we lay down in those early years are very, very important because if the foundations of a house are solid, everything that follows is solid as well. If the foundations of a house are shaky because we took shortcuts, then we can have very fancy living rooms and gold-plated taps in the bathroom. If the foundations are shaky, everything else is shaky. 
And so it is with young children. Those foundations that are laid down in those early years are very important in determining not just what happens in the first five years, but what happens lifelong. We also know what poses a risk to good brain development. So where there's a stressful environment for young children, uh, where there's child abuse or uh, where there's exposure to family violence, uh, where parents have mental health issues, where they can't parent the way they would like to because they have daily stresses. And poverty is the best example. If they're really worried about putting food on the table, the least thing they worry about is interacting in a warm way with their children. Where, that, where there's a stressful environment for a long period of time, that interferes with brain development, it interferes with those foundations that we talked about, and it creates long-term consequences. And so in the last 10 years, there's been another body of research that we call the life course research. And that tells us what happens in those early years can have lifelong consequences. So if we uh, examine the sort of conditions that many countries worry about in adult life, like poor literacy, uh, crim criminality, diabetes, chronic heart disease, um, family violence, uh, many of those conditions begin in pathways that begin in those early years of life. So that makes it doubly important to get the early years right. Not, on, not only do we want to get it right for children, but indeed we want to get it right for society long term. And what's really interesting now is more and more economists are now coming to the table and looking at how powerful that research data are. And they're saying that the most, that the best investment that any country can make is in early childhood development. So WHO, UNICEF, the World Bank, all these international organizations are now uh, urging governments to invest in early childhood because that's the best chance of a prosperous, uh, high product, uh, productivity society. Generally, how can parents uh, contribute in uh, child development in their own small ways? Well, I think to create what we call a nurturing and responsive environment, to understand that that environment they provide for children is terribly important. So there's a huge amount they can do to uh, ensure that their child has a good future. I mentioned good nutrition. I mentioned the importance of immunization, keeping the child perfectly safe. But being responsive to the child, understanding that at different phases of a child's development, he or she has needs. Uh, in the early years, they just need to be safe, but as time goes on, they need a language-rich environment. So uh, children need to be spoken to, they need to be read to. You know, one of the very important things we have come to understand is the importance of reading to young children. That creates a language-rich environment. Um, it'd be good if parents uh, learned a little bit about normal child development and had the confidence to understand, oh, oh I'm a bit worried about this child, and not to hesitate to seek help. We find lots of parents uh, don't want to seek help. They feel a bit embarrassed or they think that it's nothing. They'll think that the professional will think they're just anxious. So if, if, it, if parents think that things aren't working out or they're worried for whatever reason, go and seek help for that and get reassurance. And then there are some very good websites. You know, um, there's very good information that's available online so I think the most important thing is to create a nurturing, responsive environment for young children, uh, which is safe, which is warm, which is language rich, where the child is the focus of it. Uh, since you're mentioning language, uh, I have four-year-old nephew. He keeps asking lots of questions. Uh, I have heard that uh, you have to answer. It's like uh, 10 to uh, 20 questions sure. in, in a minute. So do you have to keep answering all good. the time? It'd be good to. It's wonderful that he's asking lots of questions. It, some children are sometimes described as learning machines, you know, they, everything they, right. is so of interest to them. And so, yes, parents get tired of answering questions, but they should try to do that because um, the, the brain is developing all of the time. The child's natural curiosity we should be responding to. And parents tell me the same thing, you know, just ask one question after the other. To the extent that they can, they should be responsive to that. But they can also initiate learning. So uh, a walk outside in nature for a three-year-old becomes a, a, a lesson. You know, the sound of the birds, the trees, the glass, the twigs. Um, I think what we say to parents is just enjoy childhood because the time passes in a second and you won't have that opportunity again. So yes, the last thing some parents want to do if they come home and they're tired and they're grumpy is answer questions. 
that celebrate that. You know, much better the child is asking all those questions than the child is withdrawn and not interested. And how important is society where a child grows up, grows up in? Society is important. Society can establish a whole lot of norms for child rearing. First of all, good public policy that supports parents, supports early learning, creates opportunities for children to go to high quality childcare, uh, creates quality preschool. There are many, many things that a government can do uh, to, to help. Uh, widespread immunization programs, looking at safety in children. Uh, so that's the first thing. Secondly, uh, society is important in terms of the norms that they establish. Um, uh, in our country, for example, up until recently, women didn't feel comfortable breastfeeding in public. Yes. Um, so that's changed now. Uh, so the social norms are important. Uh, we, we say to government, try and create what we call a child and family friendly society. Create places for parents to meet each other, uh, safe places. Create places where parents can breastfeed or where, can, where they can change a, a diaper when they need to. Um, but most importantly, they can do things like create high quality learning opportunities. They can try and develop a high quality system of good primary care so if parents have concerns they can go. They can make sure that the professionals are well trained and invest in those training programs. So yes, there's a lot that um, government and society can do. Uh, I think it's a growing trend in Bhutan right now that uh, most parents, they, when the child is cranky or when they're busy, they'll just let them watch television or they'll just give them iPad and then play some uh, games or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So how does, how, how does uh, this affect a child's brain development in the long run? Because in a way, I, I feel like they're neglect neglected as well. Sure. They are just watching television. They're not interacting. They're just watching or yeah. engage yeah. somehow yeah. though. So how does it affect in the long run? Yeah, technology and screen time are both wonderful and terrible, aren't they? That, um, the amount of learning and the exposure to the whole world is fantastic. iPad can be really uh, instructive and engaging, but we always say that it's very important to limit screen time. The American Academy, Academy of Pediatrics say that uh, there shouldn't be more than two hours a day maximum. And two some hours. maximum. And some some parents, are, uh, some professionals are uh, even uh, challenging that. And, and you're right, the, a, a, a passive iPad or a television screen does not replace the interaction that young children have with parents. That's what they crave more than anything else. Sometimes that's described in tennis terms, serve and return. The child initiates, the parent responds, the child responds, and that's terribly, terribly important. We're seeing all over the world uh, what you said, the children are watching more and more television, more and more passive learning. And this is a big uncontrolled experiment. There's no doubt that these children's brains are developing differently than they used to before television. So we always say, uh, make the most out of iPads, make the most out of screens, but supervise it, limit it, don't make that the norm. So for a busy parent who comes home from work who's trying to, do, to make dinner, it's a godsend. Yes, go and watch, go and play on your iPad. But on the other hand, don't make that the norm. Make that the exception. And I've seen time and time again in airports, for example, a really distressing situation where you have a toddler in a, uh, in a stroller trying so hard to engage parents' attention, mothers on the iPhone, yeah. and just jiggling the, the you know, yeah. trying to quieten. What the child is, is trying to say is, I want your... I want your your attention, I want you to respond to me. Mother's just shaking the pram, busy talking to somebody else. And that's very distressing for a professional. So yes, iPhones are wonderful. Yes, iPads are wonderful, but use them sparingly. And it should never be a substitute for the learning that takes place between parents and children. That interactive learning is everything. And when it comes to child with disability, uh, how does early intervention, intervention help them in the long run? Yes, so I think the same things pertain to all children, whether they have a special need, whether they have a disability or not, they still need a nurturing, responsive environment. You know, in our country, we've stopped calling it disability. We call it children with additional needs because disability, we say, tends to be a negative thing. Uh, we all have our own disability, and some, you and I, we all have some sort of disability. So we like to say that all children are special. Some children have needs that are additional to the needs of normal children. 
they need speech pathology or they need occupational therapy or they need a more nurturing environment. Um, so children like that, in your terms, children with a disability, still have normal needs. They still need to be all those things we spoke about before good nutrition, immunization, safety, safe environment, responsive environment, they still have that need. And the earlier we provide that, the better. Uh, these children may need a responsiveness that's a little different. It may need uh, early childhood professionals that are more skilled because the child doesn't hear properly or can't walk properly or whatever. Um, so it's up to them to teach the parents here's how you should be responding to your children. But the principles that I mentioned before of a responsive nurturing environment are still critical. But the, the earlier we identify that this child has special needs, the earlier we identify that this child, this child can't walk as other children or can't learn as other children, the better, because then we can modify the environment to take into account that child's additional needs. And the literature is very clear. The earlier we start, the better the outcome. Uh, actually, uh I was trying to produce a program on disability, children with disability, but it's very difficult to find parents uh, to speak up uh, about uh, those because they're embarrassed, because embarrassed right? And then there's some stigma associated with it. So um, what would be your advice to parents uh, uh, having children with uh, additional needs? Well, it's very confronting, um, even breaking bad news to parents, letting them know for the very first time your child isn't like a normal child is very very hard and parents understandably feel embarrassed they feel a sense of shame but so do parents who've got a normal child who can't provide for that child in the way they, they would like to for example um, parents or families that are disadvantaged um, poor families who can't clothe the child in the way that they would like to they feel a sense of shame as well and that's one of the things society can do. You asked me a few minutes ago about can society contribute? It can. It can normalise all of this. It can say that all children are special. And yes, some children have additional needs. Some have their disability. It's nothing to be ashamed of. We as a society need to support parents in making sure that you feel comfortable, that you know what to do, that you know what to do with the child. There's this saying that I'm sure you've read, it takes a village to raise a child. And that's so true that uh, all parents need support. Some parents need a bit more support. And some parents need a bit more support because they're sh sh ashamed or embarrassed because I've got this child. Please don't lock them away. Please reach out, get support. And then both professionals and society can do a lot to destigmatize, to make these parents feel supported and to give these children every opportunity that they have to develop normally. And it's just my personal curiosity that I have read somewhere that uh, I don't know how far it's true that all the children when they are born uh, globally, worldwide, they have a universal language. Is it true? Um, I'm not a language expert, but the answer is yes. Not just a universal language, but they can turn almost into everything. The genes provide an important substrate. You know, genetics are important, but young children who are born into a sporting environment where parents are very, very good sports people, they'll have a tendency to be good at sport. Those, parent, those children that are born into a music environment where their parents are musicians, they'll tend to be adept at music. Now, I don't think it's, nurture, I don't think it's nature, I don't think it's the genes, it's the environment that young children provide. And so it is with language. If they're born to a Bhutanese family, they'll learn the local family, the local language. If they're born to an English family, they will learn language. So to a large extent, the brain can develop according to the environment that the young child is born into. And uh, what is your general observation of status of childcare in South Asia? Well, I've been here five minutes. I've only been here one day. I've been in other countries. Um, so I'd be the last person to come into Bhutan and make comments and make conclusions. I'm not that arrogant. Um, but in South Asia, generally, this is a, a sweeping generalization, uh, the, my observation is that childcare is not as well established. It's, I think it's traditional for children to be at home, uh, as you say, often in an extended family with grandparents. I think more and more, especially for middle class families, they're realizing that childcare can uh, not only be beneficial but is not harmful uh, and it has the double benefit to society it enables parents to go out and work as well so it's win-win-win all along the line it's a win for children 
because they get to socialize and they get into a stimulating environment where they're meeting other children, they're learning new things. It's a win for parents because they can get out of their home and many parents feel trapped at home, especially those that are educated. So they go out and work, so they're happy, they're fulfilled. It's a win for the family because they're bringing an extra income so that they can afford things. And it's a win for the country because the productivity goes up. So I think for all those reasons, if we can provide high quality childcare, it must be a positive thing for countries. And uh, Dr. I think I'll want you to give a very personal, not academic, but a personal advice to all the parents who are watching this program right now. Uh, trust your instinct. You know, your, your gut feeling is very, very important. You know, we teach our medical students that if parents are worried and they're saying to a doctor, I don't feel right, there's something wrong with my child, you had better take that very, very seriously. So trust your instincts. Experts don't know the child as well as you do. Um, you'll know often what the right thing is to do and just follow your heart and follow your mind. Doctor, thank you so much for your time and uh, sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.